Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the fourth and the final in a series of webinars organized by the Policy Center for the New South to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. This is Fatem Zaham Ngov speaking, economist at the Policy Center for the New South, and I will be your moderator for today's discussion. Today's discussion is about a topic that is very close to my heart, which is climate change. Climate change has become a defining issue of our time. It is occurring worldwide and impacting all nations. Scientists, international organizations, and the overwhelming majority of the international community recognize climate change as the most systemic threat to humankind because it is impacting not only physical environment and ecosystems, but also increases social and economic vulnerabilities of countries, both developed and developing. This year, and due to the spread of the deadly COVID-19 virus, many governments implemented several restrictive measures that led to the cessation or reduction of activities. As a result, global greenhouse gas emissions considered as the main cause of climate change fell this year by 6%. However, they are expected to revert to high levels in the aftermath of the pandemic as the economic activity recovers, as you know. So in response to this situation and to overcome these challenges, states through their national legislation or international commitments must implement environmentally friendly policies and comply with their international obligation, including the Paris Agreements. Furthermore, given the scale of the challenges arising from climate change, interventions at the global level are necessary, involving states, international organizations, civil society and the, pub and the private sector. In this capacity, the UN plays a pivotal role in mobilizing the international community and maintaining the momentum on this complex and decisive challenge humanity is facing in the 21st century. To discuss all these elements, I'm honored to introduce four speakers that have worked a lot in this field. First, Mr. Ali Zerwari, welcome. He, who is he, head of international corporation and business development at Mazen. Second, Mr. Ayman Sharqawi, coordinator and charge of strategic development at Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection and ex or former emerging leader. Thank you for responding positively to the, to the invitation. Then Mr. Hamzat Burr, who is Senior Program Officer, Climate Action Team at the UN. And finally, Mr. Tiong Nyong, Co-Founder and Co-CEO of um, Aiken Lighting Africa. Welcome to all of you. And thank you for responding positively to our invitation. So to begin, 2020 was an opportunity to assist implementation of the Paris Agreement and intensify the fight against climate change. However, the spread of the COVID-19 has plunged the world in a crisis that has severe effects on economic activity and uh, human lives. In front of this situation, many question or questions arise. The first question is, as the focus now is on saving lives and recover economy, are you concerned that the fight against climate change will be delayed or interrupted? Do you think that the post pandemic recovery national policies will facilitate or impede implement the implementation of the Paris Agreement by member states. The second question is about the Paris Agreement, as we know all to ensure that member states will respect their obligations, the Paris Agreement provides for a very loose monitoring mechanism through intended nationally determined contributions. Given the difficulty to adopt a legally binding agreement, what can be done to bolster countries' commitments? The third question is about Africa, which is the most ex exposed region to the adverse effect of climate change despite its negligible carbon emissions. It is also the continent of some successful experiences in the field of renewable energy, and we can talk about Morocco, Nigeria, and South Africa. So how can the African Union as an institution contribute to the policy implementation as well as at state accountability. As, and the last question is, how can the education system and the media help raise awareness and promote the public opinion on climate change and environmental protection? 
So to organize the discussion, we will proceed as follows. The order of interventions will follow the alphabetical order. Each speaker has five to seven minutes to talk and the question will be discussed at the end of the panel. So let's start. And Mr. Zerwali, Ali Zerwali, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Fatim Zahra. Thank you, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to express my thanks to the Policy Center for the New South for organizing this important webinar uh, to commemorate the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. So it's a, a real pleasure for me to speak on the topic of uh, climate change, which is a, a recurrent and important threat that needs for urgent attention. I will uh, focus more on the role that UN can play to further develop uh, the awareness about the climate change and the actions that could be implemented, rather than the other questions. But we can come back to other questions, the other questions afterwards, and with the other panelists maybe have a more uh, interactive discussion. And so, um, in my view, the UN is a really uniquely positioned to facilitate the implication of all parts of the society. And I will give a concrete example. Uh, for me, the climate action summit that was uh, convened by the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres held on September 23rd uh, of last year is a great example of this. This summit uh, has laid out the blueprint for getting all the stakeholders of the society on board for reaching a net zero carbon emission by 2050. It has also given birth to some very important coalitions, as the one which is led by Morocco and Ethiopia. Its name is the Coalition for Sustainable Access to Energy in less developed countries and other developing countries. That is, this coalition is based on the principle of South-South cooperation with the objective to support developing countries to accelerate the access to energy using renewable energy technology. So this coalition has noted tens of supports for international institutions and initiatives and is currently being officially launched by the end of the year. Uh, the UN for this coalition played an important role in the setup of this initiative and the uh, UN gave it the needed legitimacy and credibility uh, to this end. So this is why uh, UN is critical for making the voice of developing countries heard by in this important topic, which is the climate change, while accelerating the achievement of the target that I've already mentioned. Uh, furthermore, uh, I would like also to recall that the Paris Agreement has become a landmark UN agreement to combat the climate change and accelerate the investment needed for the sustainable low carbon future. Under the agreement, uh, developed countries have committed to mobilizing $100 billion to help developing countries who are more affected by the climate change. However, I really think that this, it's not normal that the burden of climate change is being shared equally by developed countries and the developing countries. When, for me, developing countries have contributed the least to the whole problem. So developing countries are facing the double burden of climate change and socioeconomic development, which means that some countries will be more concerned about uh, energy access than energy transition uh, as the most advanced countries uh, are. So this is why I think that UN is the only area to advocate about that the support of developed countries should go beyond the financing only. As the final cost of the kilowatt hour depends in majority on the cost of the financing, and the risk mitigation tools, developed countries should innovate by providing the tools that will help to mitigate the risk perception in developing countries, as for example, uh, risk guarantee tools 
and financing conditions that will make the interest rates similar to the ones that are available in developed countries. So for me, this is really the only way to drastically ameliorate the competitiveness of renewable energy in LDCs and ODCs and present these technologies as the first option for the access to electricity and not only a possible alternative as it is now. And I come back to the coalition. So the coalition for sustainable access to energy is a concrete example of uh, a UN branded action that will help to advocate in this direction and to create the right tools that are needed by developing countries to respond to their urgent needs while fighting against the climate change at the same time. Uh, for many countries, the urgent need to extend the access to energy to their population is more important than the deployment of actions to mitigate the climate change. This is exactly where the United Nations for me can play a critical role. It provides the platform to marry between these two challenges and priorities, but also as demonstrated by the Coalition for Access to Sustainable Energy. It also facilitates for developing countries to enhance exchanges of best practices and know-how between the most advanced and the least advanced uh, ones via South-South cooperation. It brings also together developed and developing countries to work together on financial mechanisms that can reduce the perception of, uh, of investment risk in renewable energy projects. And finally, thanks to this multilateral approach, it also helps countries to understand how deploying actions against climate change could also valorize their environmental assets for the development, for the economical development and sustainable development, such as tourism, for example. So you may notice that I really focused mainly on energy and on the urgent needs of uh, developing countries, uh, rather than only climate change, because there's two subjects as are really linked for developing uh, countries. And uh, I thank you again for listening. And I will now leave the floor to the next guest. And I hope to further develop other questions later. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed Ali, for this very insightful intervention. I uh, you stressed the importance of uh, uh, helping uh, developing countries in order to mitigate the negative effects of climate change. It's not about just supporting financially, but also helping to develop this country who are um, facing double border in terms of uh, economic and social development and also the negative impact of climate change. So thank you for your very insightful intervention. And, and now we will move to Mr. Ayman Sharqawi. The floor is yours. Thank you uh, very much. It's a pleasure uh, for me to be with you today. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, I was part of the Emerging Leaders Program a few years ago. It's always great to reconnect uh, with my friends at the um, Policy Center for, for the New South. Uh, so I'd like to, it's, it's a very uh, timely, a very important question that you fielded to us. Uh, of course, uh, I'm in full support of the comments that were made earlier by my friend uh, Ali. And uh, I wanted to, uh, I guess frame my my uh, intervention by uh, sharing with you a quote uh, from the royal message that His Majesty the King Mohammed VI addressed uh, to the Climate Action Summit, uh, where my dear friend Hamza, who's uh, speaking soon, played uh, an important role. Uh, and in that royal message, which was read out by Her Royal Highness, uh, Princess Ada Hasna, the chair of the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection, I wanted to um, bring your attention to one quote in particular that said, the degradation of our environment is now a tangible reality. Uh, it poses a threat that we must address together. And in this ability to capacity and necessity for us to address such a threat together, uh, clearly uh, the United Nations system 
has an important role to play in facilitating, just as Ali was saying earlier, the kind of coordination, the kind of, uh, of action, the kind of ambition that we all need to see, whether it is specifically in the context of the Paris Agreement or more globally, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Uh, the other quote I wanted to share with you is older than this one. It's uh, from a former United Nations Secretary General, uh, Doug Hammerschultz. Uh, you must have seen it going around this particular quote quite a bit over the last few days as we're celebrating the uh, 75th birthday of the, uh, of, the, of the United Nations. And in that context, he said back in 54 uh, that the United Nations was not created to bring humanity to heaven, uh, but to save it from hell. Now, I'm not saying that climate change is bringing us to hell, but uh, I think you agree by that climate change is definitely making the planet a bit hotter. And uh, the fact that it is making the planet a bit hotter, unfortunately, has some very serious and damaging impact uh, all over the world, including uh, in Africa, which was one of the focus of the questions that, we, that you fielded to us in, the, in your opening remarks. Uh, furthermore, when it comes to the foundation specifically, so the Mohammed VI Foundation for Environmental Protection, chaired by Her Royal Highness Princess Lada Hasna, the foundation has worked in cooperation with United System for several years. Uh, United, the foundation benefits from ECOSOC accreditation. The foundation has observer status with the United Nations Environment Program, with the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And beyond that, you, the, the foundation also has dedicated MOUs with uh, UNESCO, with, uh, with uh, UNAP, with uh, the FAO, and works co in close collaboration with other stakeholders, such as, for example, UNDP. So this kind of collaboration is nothing new uh, for, for the foundation. And it has enabled the kind of multi-level um, co-construction that uh, is so important for both ambition and action when it comes to climate change, be it at the global level, at the regional level, at the national level, and then at the sub-national level, uh, implying all stakeholders of society, such as civil society in general, the private sector, uh, academia, etc. And this new, uh, more inclusive type of multilateralism is so very important for our global and individual ability to meet the challenges that achieving the, and opportunities of course as well, that achieving the objectives of the Paris Agreement and the 2030 Agenda um, uh, puts in front of us. Uh, and uh, I mentioned earlier the, the, the summit, and the, the summit is a good example, I believe, of the kind of convening power that the United Nations system has in terms of bringing together all these different types of, of stakeholders. And as I mentioned, Hamza played an important role there. One of the initiatives that was announced during the summit was the African Youth Climate Hub, which is an initiative uh, in cooperation by, between the foundation and uh, other stakeholders, such as, for example, University of Mohammed VI uh, Polytechnique, uh, in how do we respond to the voices and action of African youth when it comes to climate action in particular. And it was so important for this initiative to not be talking to youth, but to uh, on, contrary to that, but really constructing that, not talking down on them. On the, on the other hand, completely the opposite of that and really highlighting the expertise and the perspective that they bring and co-designing together with African youth the kind of initiative that they believe would be helpful to making the projects that they have in mind, the ideas they want to bring forward a concrete reality. And uh, the, lastly, I uh, will rest there, is the ability of the United Nations system to really coalesce in a timely manner and to bring to the attention of the world some issues and to correct some misconceptions that some may have. And quite recently, there were two reports uh, that came out uh, just last month. There was the United in Science report uh, that was this important collaborative effort across the UN system to highlight some important uh, messages. And I'm not gonna go in more detail. I'm sure uh, Hamza masters it far more than I do. And, and then they just actually this week, uh, um, one new report came out uh, uh, looking at the state of climate in Africa. Uh, this particular report was coordinated by the World Meteorological Organization and it highlights uh, the reality of the impacts that are being felt and those impacts uh, as such, I think it's important to not just perceive the African continent 
as um, a victim, although it is very much a victim of the negative impacts of climate change, but also as a stakeholder that is mobilized, that is in full capacity to act and to see some of the opportunities that may also uh, arise from climate action. And uh, the last point I will make is uh, go back to COP22 um, and recall that at the time, uh, all kinds of initiatives were launched that are very relevant when it comes to the capacity of Africa to meet the challenge of climate change. Among them, of course, being the AAA initiative, but also the regional commission that were announced at the special uh, African action summit that was convened on the margins of COP22. So I think uh, perceiving that the African continent is at the same time very much impacted in a negative manner by climate change, but at the same time, mobilizing its resources, um, mobilizing its capacities, fully mindful of the reality of gaps uh, so that we can meet the challenge all together and uh, strengthen uh, our capacities, particularly keeping the most vulnerable in mind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ayman, for this very brilliant entrance. So you stressed the, the, the role of uh, the international organizations in terms of, uh, of uh, implementing conven convenient and, uh, and, um, and conferences that uh, bring, bring together all, uh, all stakeholders, such as international organizations. You, you mentioned FAO, the, the United Nations and a lot of organizations that work all, all together to mitigate and to propose new ideas to mitigate the negative effects of climate change. So thank you very much for your intervention. And now we move to Mr. Hamzat Bar. Uh, just go ahead, please go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Fatem Zara, and thank you to uh, the Policy Center for the opportunity to uh, speak to you today. Uh, first, uh, congratulations to the previous speakers for uh, for uh, having set, in, uh, set the scene. I, I want to say a few things uh, first on the context where we find ourselves this year, 2020 in particular. I want to say a few words on the science. Ayman uh, kind of concluded talking about the science as well, so I'll pick up on, on, on where he left. Um, uh, I want to say a few words also about the roles with an S of the UN. Uh, in uh, addressing the current crisis, uh, the climate crisis, but the broader development agenda in general, and maybe uh, finish with um, uh, a few words about the climate strategy of the Secretary General, because as you said, I work in the climate uh, team of the Secretary General uh, in New York. And um, maybe a few concluding remarks, but I certainly hope that we will have opportunities to unpack all of this uh, later with the other speakers. So first, the context. I mean, this uh, was supposed to be an important year for climate and the environment anyway, before uh, we knew before the pandemic strike uh, struck, uh, we we were going to have the COP26, uh, which also marks the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. Uh, we uh, had the COP on biodiversity, COP15. Uh, we had a series of uh, exceptional um, uh, events on transport, for instance, sustainable transport, others. And um, probably most importantly, we, we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the UN, as you said. And across all markers, uh, this is an exceptional year, not only because of these um, uh, milestones, if you'd like, of the institutional uh, architecture, but also because of the pandemic. Uh, and the pandemic really is a game changer uh, in, many, in many ways. It has upended lives and livelihoods across the board. It has disrupted value chains. It has, in many ways, uh, the, the full impacts of this pandemic are not fully um, you know, understood yet. Uh, it will it, it will change a lot of things um, in terms of the geopolitics, in terms of uh, development agenda, in terms of the priorities and 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 the decisions that are being made today uh, are truly going to shape the next 30, 50 years. Uh, uh, so so across all markers again, this is an exceptional year. Now, what the science tells us, unfortunately, is that we are not on track to limiting climate uh, change to 1.5 degrees, which is the more uh, ambitious goal of the uh, Paris Agreement. 
And why is the 1.5 goal an important goal? It's because beyond that point, the impacts of climate change will become extremely difficult to manage uh, and in some instances impossible to manage with devastating com consequences on, on communities. And as Ali was saying and Ayman was saying, those who are the most affected are often the least responsible. Um, and so uh, the World Meteorolog Meteorological Organization uh, that Ayman mentioned released this, the United in Science report uh, a few weeks ago. And, and the data is very clear. Greenhouse gas concentrations are uh, in the atmosphere at a, are at a, a record high um, because we have to distinguish between the emissions and the existing stock of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. That stock has not diminished. Uh, so um, uh, the, 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 the signs are worrying. And when you look at the, at the recent extreme weather events uh, that have been, uh, m that have become much more frequent, for instance, uh, major floods have more than doubled over uh, um, uh, the last decade. Uh, Climate-related uh, rela disasters um, uh, overall have doubled. We have um, uh, an incidence of storms that is much more frequent. We're almost running out of Greek alphabet letters to name uh, storms on the Atlantic because we move by alphabetical order. Now we use two alphabets almost, and the and it, the end is not uh, is not is nowhere near. So the science is worrying, but we do know that solutions exist, um, and um, we are, as I said, at a crossroad. And I think the most important shift that we have to operate uh, in addition to the transition to a decarbonized uh, economy, a global economy, is a shift in mindsets. And I think that we have absolutely to move from a cost um, mindset, meaning that climate, climate action, ambitious climate action is a cost, to a mindset where we see it as an opportunity. Uh, we have to think about the return on investment of ambitious climate action. And it so happens that uh, ambitious climate action is actually good uh, for economic development and for businesses. Uh, for instance, uh, for every $1 million is, uh, invested uh, to produce a kilowatt hour, uh, fossil fuels produce three times less jobs than renewable energy, for instance. Um, uh, the uh, International Energy Agency forecasts that over the three, uh, the next three years, we can create almost 10 million jobs uh, just in, um, in the energy transition, and this includes uh, developing markets. So um, we really have to operate that shift, I think, in, in also the way we approach um, climate climate um, action. The on the positive side as well is the the, the, the recent developments, well, the, the announcements that we've been hearing uh, from various governments uh, are very encouraging. I'm thinking about the European Union, for instance, uh, who pledged to a green recovery with investments north of 550 billion euros uh, in green projects over the next seven years. Uh, other commitments include, uh, of course, the do no harm principle and a, and a commitment to address transition for workers affected by the energy transition, for instance. We, we have also announcements, uh, President Xi Jinping uh, of China announced at the General Assembly at, uh, in New York, I mean, virtually in New York, uh, that China uh, was going to uh, present a new NDC uh, uh, that will be more ambitious and that the uh, uh, emissions of China will peak before 2030, which is an improvement, and that uh, China will uh, reach carbon neutrality before 2060. So um, you add to this, for instance, South Korea, which has pledged to a green recovery uh, and, and carbon neutrality, Japan, uh, just uh, yesterday uh, with the new prime minister, Suda announcing that uh, he uh, uh, commits the country to carbon neutrality. And so that's right there, more than half the, gl the global economy committing to uh, net zero uh, carbon targets and sending very strong market signals uh, about the direction of travel of the global economy. And I'm hopeful that others will be joining uh, this, this momentum as well. So this has implications as well. I mean, we're talking here about major economies, but, but this has implications for smaller economies and 
developing uh, uh, economies as well, uh, because it has implication on, on, on the value chains of these countries. I mean, the global value change uh, go far beyond the borders of, of the countries that I just mentioned. So, so, so the, the, the suppliers will have to adapt uh, in terms of market access. There might be implications as well in terms of capital markets access, in terms of multilateral funding, and even in terms of FDI, foreign direct investment, for instance, when you have co uh, companies like Microsoft and Google um, announcing carbon neutrality uh, targets and even Microsoft announcing carbon uh, negative targets, uh, this has implications on the way they invest their money. Uh, so will they, will they open a new headquarter or new operation in a country that doesn't allow them to source their energy from renewables, for instance, you know that might that might close that opportunity to countries that do not transition uh, quickly enough. So, so there are many encouraging signs, but of course, none of this can happen without proper support, especially from the for developing countries. My colleagues before me mentioned the, the different pledges that donor countries uh, have made in terms of the hundred billion or other forms of uh, support, and in the current crisis where the debt issue is even more intense when the fiscal space of developing countries is even more constrained because uh, revenues are falling, exports are falling sometimes, uh, uh, but but expenses are, are, are going up because of the response crisis, etc. So in this context of very tight fiscal space, uh, international support um, and the mobilization of all stakeholders is even more important than it was before. So uh, the role of the UN in, in all of this, I mean, there are several roles that the UN plays. And, and since climate change is really now, I mean, a, a pervasive issue that touches on all sectors, uh, it affects all the, the, the work of the UN from crisis response to peacekeeping and humanitarian uh, operations to policy support, to uh, um, um, programmatic, uh, um, work, uh, pr programmatic work in countries. I mean, all of these uh, aspects of the work of the UN are impacted. Um, uh, I mean, the, 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 the UN plays a role in terms of providing, first of all, the science, the science-based uh, evidence uh, to inform policy making. So whether it's the IPCC, the Inter uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the World Meteorological Organization, the World Health Organization, UNEP, UNDP, UNCTAD, any, I mean, all of the entities of the UN produce very important information and data uh, that, that, that in which we have to ground uh, uh, policy making. Uh, then, of course, the, there is the operational side where uh, the UN assists again on, in terms of peacekeeping, humanitarian operations, and the impacts of climate change on that aspect of the work cannot be overstressed. Uh, already today, I was talking just a few days ago with colleagues who've been in field visits in the Sahel region, for instance, we see clear impacts of climate change in terms of the um, pastoral uh, communities having to migrate uh, outside of the traditional boundaries, etc., and this creates conflicts, etc. So, so there are consequences uh, across the board. And then, I mean, there is also the uh, role, the institutional role that that my colleagues mentioned: the convening power, the fact of bringing different stakeholders together under the same roof, and providing the institutional framework, uh, uh, whether it's the Paris Agreement, the SD, uh, the the the. the the 2030 agenda, um, the Addis Abeba, um, uh, Ayman, help me here, uh, uh, um, disaster, uh, the Sendai framework, sorry, <laughs> I'm talking about that. Uh, so, so providing the institutional arrangements, but also I would like to say maybe also acting as a normative voice. Uh, the UN uh, also has a role in terms of setting the norms and standards and uh, bringing everyone to agree on a common definition and, 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 and understanding of the challenges ahead and the opportunities ahead. So, so there is that. Um, I, in, I'm, I'm going to try to be brief to conclude because I've been talking a lot, but in terms of the priorities of the Secretary General um, regarding climate ambition, uh, they're based around three pillars, on three pillars. Mitigation, first of all, securing commitments to deliver emission reductions 
to bend the curve uh, and to put us back on track to a 1.5 degrees um, uh, target, uh, especially from the major emitters. But just a parenthesis, when we talk about major emitters and we talk about developing countries, we have to keep in mind that potentially uh, uh, developing countries are going to be the big emitters of the future. And, and the historical responsibility is being really, uh, I mean, um, uh, many developing countries are catching up fast uh, to, the, uh, to, to, to the developed uh, uh, countries as well, but G20 countries remain the absolute priority in terms of uh, mitigation. Uh, in terms of adaptation, I think that's uh, absolutely a, um, a major, major um, priority because if anything, the COVID crisis um, has uh, showed us that uh, resilience uh, is uh, absolutely important that we have to prepare better uh, and assess better risks and and embed resilient uh, systems uh, into um, into our economies. And uh, finally, the third pillar is finance, mobilization of finance and access uh, to quality finance to deliver the transition to a resilient and low carbon economy. And so he proposed also six climate uh, positive actions to guide the green recovery, because truly the, the level of public spending that we're seeing today is unprecedented in peacetime. Uh, and, and so with all that public spending, we have to make sure that we use it to have a green, uh, resilient, inclusive, uh, and just recovery. Uh, and for that, he suggested six climate positive actions, invest in green jobs, don't bail out polluting industries, and fossil fuel subsidies, take climate risks into account in all financial and policy decisions, work together, uh, very important uh, international solidarity. And last point, leave no one behind. This is crucial. And so we have initiated a, a, a number of processes uh, uh, recently, the finance for development process uh, that has been convened by the Secretary General with the help of Canada and Jamaica. Um, uh, the um, socioeconomic response uh, framework of the UN, which, um, uh, which uh, UN country teams are implementing uh, by developing socioeconomic response plans to provide policy recommendations and support to, uh, to uh, over 130 countries where we are present. And in terms of climate action more specifically, uh, I, 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 sh I have to mention the, the, the uh, outst outstanding work of the UNDP uh, through its climate promise, uh, we, which is assisting uh, over uh, well over 100 countries in revising their uh, national uh, determined contributions, their NDCs, uh, ahead of COP26. So uh, uh, there is uh, there is that, and a few final points very quickly. We are also, as my colleague said before me, engaging with the private sector and civil society. So, for instance, on on private finance, the Secretary General has a special envoy uh, in the person of Mark Carney, uh, who um, uh, does a lot of work with, with institutional investors and regulators and central banks on uh, how to better mainstream climate considerations into policy uh, and, and financial uh, regulation and with the private sector on how they can green their um, portfolios um, and um, align better with the Paris Agreement. Uh, and okay. so I'll, I'll finish here, but uh, happy to continue the conversation with my colleagues. Okay, thank you, Mr. Spar, for your very insightful intervention. Uh, thank you for remembering us uh, the major, major damages of climate change and the science, uh, that science is telling us that the going beyond 1.5 is... Uh, is very bad and the world will record huge losses. You mentioned also many solutions as examples shifts in mindset, return investment of climate change, which has huge benefits uh, such as creating jobs and uh, providing revenues. You also insisted on uh, the role of the UN, UN by mentioning actions that the UN is already doing as um, um, as providing science evidences, uh, fi financial support, data, and all, and all of this. So thank you so much for very insightful uh, intervention, and we will and I will get back to you for uh, further and uh, other questions. So I think uh, it's uh, 
the turn of Mr. Tion, but I think we lost him. So um, I would like to go through some questions uh, so we can wait for him or just uh, if he doesn't connect, we can just uh, see uh, what uh, he will uh, send us by, by email or something like that. So uh, the first question is about the, the role of media and education system, as I already mentioned in the opening remarks. So um, how can the education system and the media help raise awareness and promote the opinion, public, public opinion on climate change and environmental protection, according uh, to you, Mr. Ayman Shalqawi? Let me unmute myself. Uh, my pleasure. And certainly, uh, the education system as a whole and the media have such an important role when it comes to uh, awareness raising and incapacitating the stakeholders, um, whether it is at the at all levels, really, because it's education with a big E, as one would say, it's education throughout life, uh, and not just for youth, as important and, of course, as youth is. Uh, so uh, as an attempt to, to answer, contribute elements of an answer to that question, I will say that uh, from the perspective of the, of the foundation, the foundation for many years has been uh, engaging uh, at the national level with uh, youth, uh, with a focus on education for sustainable development. Uh, two programs in particular come to mind, one of them being the Echo Schools program uh, that enabled millions of Morocco, millions of Moroccan youth to benefit from uh, additional insights on the environment and the role of the environment in the global well-being. And then we have the young reporters for the environment that I think is a good connection uh, to the question you asked because it's both about youth and education, it's also about the media. It's uh, really um, co-constructing with, uh, with youth some uh, media documents, whether it is pictures or short articles that discuss the environment that they have right around them. So I think these, these are examples of the how the foundation perceives the, the importance of youth. Those are just two programs, but youth uh, is a constant, and education in general is a constant component of all the activities of the foundation across the different programs. Uh, as an example, uh, the air climate program of the foundation looks at um, works with youth, of course, but also with the private sector, with uh, local authorities, when it comes to both raising awareness to the air quality, to the uh, air, um, air quality pact. And this particular pact is was uh, actually the first initiative in the country uh, working together with the private sector uh, so that the different businesses and then also uh, at a later stage, uh, local authorities can understand the kind of, um, of emissions, the greenhouse gas emissions that they have when, through their activities. And then looking at those emissions, they can also look at what they can do to reduce them. And then lastly, for the emissions that are not in a position right now to, to reduce, how they can compensate for those emissions. And the, the foundation was the first stakeholder in Morocco to introduce the voluntary uh, compensation mechanism called the CVC, Compensation Volontaire Carbone, uh, that enabled those stakeholders to either through uh, planting uh, trees, uh, specifically around the Marrakesh uh, Palm Grove, uh, or through the electrification of rural schools, more than 1,000 uh, rural schools in Morocco have benefited from these programs, uh, compensate for the emissions that they have not been able to abate so far. So those are some examples how we can, uh, through education for sustainable development, through raising awareness, working hand in hand with um, for climate action and for climate ambition. And lastly, more at the regional level, uh, for several years now, the foundation has been running a program of training uh, young African reporters, so young African media professionals, when it comes to the environment, because as you were saying, it's about you, it's about the media. The media is a very important stakeholder in terms of transmitting and relaying information. And therefore, for that, for that relay, to understand how to speak about the environment, what are the issues, what are the challenges, and to transmit correct information uh, is very, very important. So yes, I'll rest here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your response and for the example, concrete example that you give. Uh, it's very insightful and we should learn about how to use the education system and the media to enhance uh, awareness about uh, climate change negative impact in order to cope with its negative impact. So the question now is for Mr. Mohamed Ali Zarwali, who spoke about uh, ener the energy transition. And I, I was wondering uh, that 
Energy transition, particularly in developing countries, is a very complex process. We know all this that involves in that technical studies and an important financial support. So in your opinion, how can developing countries properly assess uh, their, their um, technical studies and decarbonization pathway? And of course, how, uh, and, we, and I will talk about also uh, technical uh, capacity building. And, and as you know, using these new technology involves also having uh, some capacities, technical capacities, and we all, know that developing countries don't have yet the, these capacities. So for you, in your opinion, how these developing countries could um, enhance their, 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 um, their capacities and how they, are, they, they could finance and support uh, their uh, policies uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, help mitigating the climate change effects? So thank you, Fatim Zara, for your question. And I think you just pointed out the real issue and the challenge that has, uh, firstly, to address developing countries, which is the lack of know-how and the need of capacity reinforcement. Because globally, in order to deploy actions to mitigate the climate change, to or actions to develop access to energy based on sustainable technologies and renewable energy te technologies, we need a certain level of know-how in our developing countries. And what we believe in here in Morocco uh, and in uh, and it's this vision also of His Majesty the King Mohammed VI, we believe that southern countries need to believe in other southern countries and develop the know-how exchange and the cooperation, the South-South cooperation, because basically we are facing the same challenges and the solutions that are de deployed in the most advanced southern countries to address these challenges are globally the same as the one that could be deployed in the least advanced countries. We, the solutions that are uh, available in developed countries are not always adaptable to developing countries. So we really believe in the development of the South-South co cooperation. And this is why still to, to implement the vision of His Majesty the King, Morocco uh, and Ethiopia launched to, during the Climate Action Summit, the Coalition for Sustainable Access to Energy, which is the first coalition that is held by Southern countries at the UN and who is based on the principle of South-South cooperation to enhance, enhance this uh, know-how exchange and experience exchange between Southern countries. So <clears throat> this is maybe the key to accelerate the mitigation of the climate change and the climate deployment of technologies that are protecting the climate when accelerating the access to energy and to sustainable development to our population. <clears throat> so globally, maybe it's one mm, direction that should be further explored and, uh, uh, and developed in order to support this, this country. And when we come back, because the second part of your question was related to technical assistance. We believe also that this technical assistance could be uh, provided by Southern countries to other Southern countries, maybe based on some kind of trilateral cooperation with developer uh, countries who could finance this uh, technical assistance between these countries these countries because I, we, I still come back to the first idea is that the most advanced developing countries have faced some challenges that could be easily duplicated in other uh, developing countries. We do not need always to reinvent the wheel, but we need to innovate and to ameliorate the, the wheel each time. 
So if I have to advocate about something, it's really to further develop the South-South cooperation because uh, now Southern countries have to, become, to, to begin to trust themselves and to take their destiny between our, their hands. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mohamed Ali. I think uh, Mr. Ayman Sharqawi would like to add a point. Yes, apologies. I realized uh, after that I forgot to mention one, uh, one other example. Uh, well, first thing I wanted to say, of course, is that all these activities are not, uh, that I mentioned earlier, are not done by the foundation at all, uh, alone. Uh, they are done by the foundation in close collaboration with its partners, uh, whether it is in the public space or the private space. I think it's important to keep in mind that even in those activities, there is an example of the impact that uh, collaboration, uh, public, private, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and broader uh, can have for, for climate action. So I think uh, it's important to keep in mind. The second point I, uh, I wanted to, to add is uh, highlight an example of collaboration between the uh, foundation, the Ministry of Education in Morocco, and the Sustainable Development Solution Network that together uh, over the last few months have been looking at the curricula with a very uh, certain age group uh, that is in terms of the books that are being used to teach to uh, Moroccan school children and together uh, looking at how sustainable development is featured in those curricula and how it can be further highlighted. And it was, I think, uh, very much an example that uh, um, exemplifies the role that uh, education can play when it comes to sustainable development in, in general. And, and lastly, I think uh, I wanted to also highlight the fact that uh, Morocco as a country uh, plays an important role when it comes to uh, facilitating uh, multilateral cooperation for climate action. And the example I wanted to give, which is, I guess, uh, quite recent, is the group, the work uh, done by the permanent mission of the Kingdom of Morocco in the UN uh, that is co-chairing in collaboration with France, uh, this group of friends uh, for climate action that meet and discuss how uh, we can all collaborate together to foster additional action and ambition and means of implementation as an important element of that action and ambition going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ayman, for your intervention. So the, my last question is for Mr. Hamza, and it's about uh, the Paris Agreement as you know, and as you work at the UN, uh, UN Nations and the United Nations. So I may, my question is about the Paris Agreement, and um, I, I want to know what is your um, opinion about the mechanism through um, the mechanism of intended nationally determined con con contributions and how um, how countries uh, could um, co commit more and uh, more to their uh, to their international obligations right uh, well thank you for the question but uh, before answering i just wanted to uh, go back to the um, awareness raising um, uh, issue uh, just to mention that uh, in the same uh, line uh, that uh, of, that Ayman was uh, was uh, arguing about the importance of engaging with the youth uh, I just wanted to flag that the secretary general has established a youth advisory group uh, on climate change uh, uh, comprised of uh, youth um, environmental activists from all over the world, uh, including from Africa. By the way, the chairwoman of that youth advisory group is a young lady from uh, Sudan. Uh, and as well, um, last year at the Climate Action Summit uh, convened by the Secretary General, we had a youth summit, uh, which, uh, which was a central piece uh, of that. And all of this because, uh, I mean, our greatest single hope is, is, is the level of um, uh, implication and ambition that the youth uh, carries. Uh, uh, it's very uh, heartwarming uh, to see young people having fully embraced uh, this, this agenda, that they understand it and that they understand that it's a, a systemic challenge for them and for their future. So just on that and, and on awareness raising, I, it's important to raise awareness. Uh, as a, a good friend of mine, uh, Mohamed Ado from Kenya uh, used to say, uh, or says, uh, he, he often says that in Africa, we're the least responsible, the most impacted and the least informed as well about the impact of climate change. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know that we, you know, if it's true across the board, but uh, 
you know, it's definitely a big issue to raise awareness, um, not only for the populations, but I would I would say for policymakers as well, and the private sector as well. Uh, and 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 awareness raising needs to be done not only on 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 the problems and the impacts, uh, but also on the solutions that do exist. Because again, uh, as as Mark Carney says. Uh, the transition to a net zero world is the biggest commercial opportunity of the 21st century. So um, raising awareness, yes, on solutions too. Uh, I wanted to say that. Um, in terms of uh, how to best uh, meet commitments uh, in the framework of the Paris Agreement, I mean, <clears throat> first of all, uh, um, you know that uh, it's uh, the Paris Agreement is a, a kind of a hybrid system when where there is both a bottom-up approach through the contribution, the national contributions, and also a top-down approach by setting long-term targets for everyone. Uh, I mean, collective targets um, uh, and providing some guidance on on how to get there. So it's 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 not perfect, of course. Uh, it's uh, contrib national contributions are voluntary, um, and there is no enforcing mechanism per se. Uh, but again, uh, whether you see it as an investment opportunity or as a cost, your 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 um, behavior towards climate action is going to be uh, is, going, is going to depend a lot on on whether you see it as a perceived opportunity or as a cost. Um, for developing countries, the increasing ambition means, first of all, getting more support on means of implementation, on finance, on technical uh, assistance, technology transfer, etc. Because it's absolutely uh, impossible for them to do more with less, because now they do have even less you know, again, fiscal space than they used to have before. Uh, the big budgets and deficits are are growing. I mean, budgets are shrinking and deficits are growing. So, so I mean, provision of support is the first uh, prerequisite for more ambition for many, uh, if not most, developing countries. Uh, second, I would say that, uh, you know, I believe in uh, making long-term plans, uh, long-term strategies uh, in the, f you know, we have to reach uh, uh, net zero emissions uh, by 2050. I think that starting from that point uh, and, and looking at what are the necessary intermediary necessary steps to get there is a good way to think about the NDCs and, and what targets you need to get to uh, by which milestone. Um, and uh, it, it really brings coherence to the whole plan. And it also helps with the capacity building discussion uh, that we were having because making plans is the best way also to learn more about these issues, about the inventories, about uh, the solutions, about about the available finance, about all of that. So um, uh, uh, I, that that's what I uh, can say about um, um, the the NDCs. Of course, we are um, in 2020. Um, uh, I mean, at COP26, the the uh, uh, um, member states, the parties to the Paris Agreement, uh, have to submit the new round uh, of NDCs, uh, whether revised or uh, updated. Um, and it's uh, absolutely essential that they do that well ahead of COP26 uh, by uh, increasing the level of ambition on mitigation targets, but also uh, uh, on, on adaptation. So um, um, again, uh, international cooperation, uh, understanding that this is an opportunity all of these are are, are potential uh, avenues for increased ambition. Thank you very much, Mr. Tsbar, for your insightful intervention. And uh, unfortunately, we have reached the end of the panel. And um, to say a few words before ending the panel, I would like to thank all the panelists for really insightful comments and thoughts and some really inspiring vision of where we can go with coping with climate change negative effects. It's been truly exciting event and I am I want to leave you with some thoughts that have come to comments after comments. So the, the first thought is climate change is the most sweet to humankind. The second is 
UN is already playing a pivotal role by providing financing, science evidences, data, bringing together all stakeholders. But also uh, the support that should be done should be go beyond just financing and helping developing countries to mitigate negative effects of climate change as they, uh, they were not responsible for most of gas emissions that are around us. Education system and media plays also play also a major role in terms of information dissemination and could also help to get mitigate with climate change but, um, negative effects. And as solution, shift in mindset are one of solutions that uh, that would help to cope with climate change negative effect impacts. So, uh, um, such as the use of new technologies, which offers great opportunities in terms of job value and value added creation. So thank you again for participating and hope to see you all in future webinars. Thank you so much.